Why trust the Bible? It seems like Christians just take the Bible for granted and assume that it's true. But is it? How do we know that it hasn't been corrupted or changed over time? Today, I'm going to outline why the New Testament is one of the most historically reliable documents of the ancient world, and therefore, why you should treat it as such. Hey, I'm Bailey. I'm Michael. And I'm David. And welcome to the Facing the Gates podcast. Dun, dun, dun. dun. I don't know why I am acting like I'm a... You guys can't see this, but I'm like clucking like a chicken for some reason. <laughs> yeah. He's acting very Michael over there. Yeah, well... And I'm being cool and calm. What's the going Mountain on? Dew's hit. So Monster. No, no. Just Mountain Dew, to, Mountain Dew tonight. Uh, last time we talked about... The history of the Bible, essentially, uh, you know, how it was written, translated, and canonized, and all that good stuff. Uh, and today, we're going to be talking about the reliability of the New Testament, because this is something, um, growing up, it was just never a question I had. Um, but it is a question that people who are skeptical of Christianity do have. Obviously, uh, the New Testament is a 2,000-year-old collection of books well, roughly 2,000 years old, um, how do we know that it hasn't been changed and how do we know that we can trust it? Uh, this is a big topic, but I'm going to give my uh, do my best to give a brief overview on why we know it's reliable. Um, a majority of what I'm discussing, though, as a, as a full stop disclosure, uh, it is based off of Inspiring Philosophy's YouTube series, The Reliability of the New Testament. So if you want more detail on what I'm discussing in this episode, uh, a link will be in the sources for you to check out those. Um, so there's different areas uh, that we're going to discuss for the reliability of the New Testament. And starting out, we're going to start with the manuscripts. So there are over 5,800 original Greek manuscripts and over 10,000 original Latin manuscripts and about 1 million quotes of the New Testament from early church fathers. The closest ancient works with similar numbers is called the Iliad, which is a Greek poemer, uh, poem by Homer, which has about 1,800 original manuscripts, followed by the Suetonius, which is a history book, which has about 200 or, uh, original manuscripts. We only have seven manuscripts of Plato's most popular work, The Republic, and 49 manuscripts of Aristotle's entire library of works. Yet we don't question whether or not we can trust those. Early manuscripts and fragments of the manuscripts date back to 70 to 150 years of being written, compared to the hundreds of years of other works uh, around this time. Manuscripts are compared when translating to other languages or uh, making new versions of translations, and then these manuscripts are preserved for future reference when translating or transliterating. So it's not like a game of telephone. They are referring to these manuscripts when they're translating. Based upon textual criticism, which is comparing the manuscripts, we have a 94% accuracy rate, meaning that 94% of the words are exactly the same across all of these manuscripts. The remaining 6% variation in the manuscripts are mostly spelling differences, 75% in fact, um, or variations of Greek synonyms, which is... 15% of those changes. Some are late changes, less than 9%. Very little actually affect the meaning of the text, which is 1-3%. to 3%. For example, uh, one change that affects the meaning of the text would be Revelation 13.18. 
Some manuscripts report the mark of the beast as 666, while others report it as 616. This does change the meaning of the text, but it isn't a core doctrine to the understanding of the Christian faith. There are also footnotes that explicitly say some manuscripts read this, others read this. Most variations are that are unresolved can be resolved by comparing the text with other manuscripts or with other places in the Bible that reference the same idea. Um, also, ancient people didn't have the technology to document everything like we do today, so they had various alternative methods to retain that information. Oral traditions, which included the teachings, oral traditions included the teaching in front of uh, and people in. I just had a stroke. Sorry. Uh, oral traditions included teaching in the public in front of the entire community, repeating the message and relying on those who heard the message to keep it intact. The community was heavily relied upon to preserve its teachings. So I'll let you guys give your thoughts on that before I move on to the next section. I'm not sure if, if there's anything to have thoughts on. I'm not sure if my thoughts are for this section yet, so I'm going to reserve my thoughts until... Yeah, I mean, the main thing you already know was, like, the kind of slight differences. And, as you know, like, it can change the meaning. But also, as we speak in the previous episode, context changes the meaning a lot more. Yeah. Yeah, because I think I have a very controversial statement to be an agnostic. Yeah, theist. and also with, like, the um kind of in viewing, as you said, like, Plato, Aristotle... For a lot of people, I guess, since it's one person, it's easier to be like, oh, yeah, it, it, this is right, instead of a bunch of works made by different people with different, slightly different years behind them and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, a lot well, of... the New Testament was written roughly in a 40-year period. Yeah. So, within those 40 years, it was written where kind of document like Plato he would have kind of spurts of doing this 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 yeah. but and also like the I think Library of Alexandria burning and whatnot we lost a lot of history mm -hmm. so I guess that could all that's also one big thing that is surprising that with all like the times of like book burnings and whatnot people rejecting literacy and that like the Bible has kind of survived yeah yeah and not quite on the same tone of book burnings but modern people trying to override a dialect and try to control the conversations of certain things within the bible instead of allowing free thought in uh experimentation and well thought experimentations and trying to find your own meaning Mm -hmm. I think that has a lot to do with a lot of people's uh Kermenudic. uh you're talking about the way they interpret things or and also that ties into people being wary of the word and trying to control that dialect yeah. too. I I guess to put kind of simply like the uh televangelists using oh. like the scripture for oh I need a new jet plane. Or, yeah, and look. people like, oh, this is the only way this can be interpreted. Yeah, uh, where yeah. the fundamentalists and like word of faith televangelists are like the bane of existence of Christianity. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it, so Christianity is its own worst enemy in the eyes of a lot of people. Well, when it becomes a massive thing, you're gonna have it, a lot gonna, of idiots. You're gonna have yeah. nutcases. Well, the yeah. people, the like. And Worst how, offenders are the ones that always stands out. Yeah. yeah, and it's it's how they try to control the uh, rhetoric and dialect push forward. That really pushes a lot of people away from looking at it outside of religious text and as a historical text. Yeah. And so I think that's even more damning than the fires and the loss to history. And that's not to say that, you know, it's any less valid, but... 
kind of an outsider's viewpoint, but I do have a very controversial statement I'll say for the end. Oh boy. All right. Well, I guess I'll move on to the next section, which is the authorship, um, which people who don't know anything about the Bible, um, it's going to be something that's like probably a shock for a lot of Christians, but for people um, who are informed or against Christianity, they're going to use this against it. But basically, um, ancient people were far better at memorizing things than we are. Uh, For example, it was common for Jews during this time to have memorized the entire Torah by the age of 14. Just so you know, I can't even memorize the first chapter of Genesis. Yeah, because, I mean, back then, besides, like, the work you need to get done, what else did you have to do? We They weren't consumed, they were consumed socially through work and then through spirituality and religion. So, it, it makes sense that they would have more time and... Yeah, they had the Especially mental capacity with literacy. to remember things. Also, they weren't, like, constantly busy like yeah. we are. And ah. liter- well, they were. I mean, they were, but, but a, like, they're not, like, constantly distracted the way yeah. we are. You know and what I mean? And also, as with, like, literacy being so sparse, what you hear when you hear someone, you start thinking, okay, okay. It, so, you might be able to share it, even if it's a small fable, a funny joke, or an entire religious work. That's just kind of how a lot of people had to take it because you might never see them again. So if it's important to you, you might want to remember that. Yeah. Yeah, And plus, we as a modern society take more stances in different things than, say, memorization. We try to be a more free-thinking, open community where, say, back then... We could just write stuff now. Yeah. Yeah. But we, Back then, yeah. it was survival and what allows you to survive. And a lot of people, that's spirituality. Yeah. That gives them the force to wake up every day, go into the fields, and work their ass off for 12 hours, go home, eat, and pray. And so I think it's a l- very... It's a very different culture. In very different times. Yeah. I mean, even as far back as the 1800s, people were doing that. Yeah. And, yeah. So, oftentimes, uh, teachers would repeat their teachings over and over again to get the students, and then get the students to repeat it back to them until it was committed to memory. Um, There were also certain techniques the ancient people used um, for remembering the teachings of Jesus. For example, Jesus taught in uh, using parables, which are much easier to remember, even the filthy atheist David can probably remember at least one of Jesus's parables, even though he likely hasn't heard them in years. Uh, he probably named something. I think it's more one of those. Or, if you or, start naming them, he'll be like, "Oh, oh yeah, shit!" Yeah, yeah. yeah, because like as you, you said, may not that name it off the top. Call me head. off guard. And it's like, okay, name one, David. Do it now. I can't. name one, Bailey. I, on on the now. spot, I can't. I have them. I know down you here. do. I know I'm, you do. I'm, I'm, I'm going to use it as an example. I was trying to segue. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, We're not professionals. Anyway, um, Jesus also used visual languages or visual language and memorable images. For example, it is easier to go th- for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Mark uh, ten twenty five. Yep. He also used wordplay in a technique called parallel, parallelismus mem- membrorum. Memorium. Membrum, membrorum. Membrorum. Which means to give a sentence in a similar form so that the passage has a pattern and rhythm. For example, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened for you. Luke eleven nine. Bars. Yeah, I mean, I mean uh, repetition is the key to memory. Yeah, Repet- so these are these are techniques that he used to kind of get it stuck in people's minds. Yeah. And I mean, same thing we do with songs. I can recite like ten different songs off the top of my head. Yeah, because there's a pattern. I mean, yeah. you recite the ABCs in a specific way. 
a specific song pattern. Right. So Mary had a little lamb. So the bottom line is we may not have the exact words that Jesus said verbatim in every case, like some biblical inheritance will have you believe. But that's not the point. The point is that the New Testament is preserving Jesus' teachings. So, uh, uh, my, my brain is blanking. Essentially, we didn't have a tape recorder and a camera going around filming Jesus and getting his exact words. They relied heavily on the community to preserve the teachings, at least for a little while. Yeah, and it was still, like we mentioned um, in the last episode, which we're going to talk about this next, is the dating. The Gospels and the Epistles were still written fairly early on, um, within the lifetimes of the people who uh, saw these things. So you can't really get away with a conspiracy that way because you could just go to the source and say, hey, I heard so-and-so said this about you, and they said, yeah, this is yeah. true. Like, hey, I heard you talk. Check your sources, you know. Hey, I heard you talk shit. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Um, yeah, and even in um, two episodes ago when we were talking, you were talking about the outside sources, mm-hmm. it's like, yeah, even our people documented that. Yeah, yeah. We have any other... Uh, thoughts on the authorship before we move on into dating the dating not dating yeah i know i know what you mean english is weird see Mm -hmm. we only have one word for dating and it means two it means it means well the modern term means more than one thing the original term meant yeah what we're talking about right now now we put semantics we put courtship as dating yeah i just call swiping right or left on tinder you don't even have a tinder I've never had a Tinder. I haven't had to have a Tinder. Good for you. It's pretty gross. I've never had one. I, I mean, if you're trying to sink your meat in a ship, no. trying to sink a few ships and ruin a few families, it's the easy <laughs> way to do it. That's terrible. Bless America. All right. Well, let's talk about dating. Dating the New Testament, not dating not your courtship. Tinder. Not courtship. Yeah. yeah. Not, not, not dating the J-Man. Courting, as, as it not were. trying to sink your meat. So, the New Testament in its entirety was written very quickly after Jesus' death, at least for this period of time. The Gospels were estimated to have been written between 40 and 70 years after Christ's death, and the Epistles were written within 30 years. This is something that is unheard of in ancient cultures, because a lot of other um, sources will have their documents like written like, a hundred years or two hundred years after the thing that happened. Um, the dating of the New Testament documents is determined by their references to other world events, as well as being referenced by other works discussing things mentioned in the New Testament. For example, Acts was likely written before Christians were persecuted because the author, Luke, doesn't speak harshly of Rome. Other writers at the time, such as Josephus, mentioned Jesus of Nazareth and his followers, though more on that in a minute. Um, many creeds were, poted, were quoted by Paul in the epistles, which were before the Gospels, written before the Gospels, that can verify what the oral tradition, the Gospels, were taught when they were written down. Many people between 100 and 200 A.D. were talking about Jesus' story who were in widely different regions separated by oceans. If it were a conspiracy, how did it explode so quickly? The reason authors like Luke mention where people were from, like Jesus of Nazareth or Joseph of Arimathea, um, partly this is because this is just how they spoke during that time but also it is so like i mentioned uh the original audience could fact check them luke was a historian and if you didn't trust what he said you could go directly to the sources who were usually the eyewitnesses who were still living it's kind of like attaching a bibliography to his claims the point is no one would be able to get away with spreading a massive conspiracy like this without being called out Also, Matthew and John were the only disciples of Christ who wrote Gospels. If the story were made up, 
why wouldn't the church fathers have cited other apostles as gospel authors instead of Mark, who was a follower of Peter, and Luke, who was a commissioned historian? That's the end of that section. You can give your thoughts now. Yeah, and I mean, that's like, even in modern times, there's people trying to add stuff to the Bible and all that, and Christians like, you're full of shit. Yeah. It, For lack of better terms. Really, the main thing falls upon the accountability of man. And at least from a, not just bashing the Bible, just to bash the Bible. With, but that falls with any written history. Mm-hmm. So, and also a lot of it is lost, again, as we talked about last episode, the culture and time of the place. Yeah. Because, like, for us, the like the major pushing factor towards, like, Christianity at our times is conservatism and the right and post-Cold War U.S. At least in America. Yeah. yeah. Because, I, I mean, mean, another cult- cult- uh, yeah, country well, I mean, is different. From but our perspective in e- America. Even a lot of European countries, there's been a push to conservati- conservatism and... It's kind of like after so, uh, so long of a progressive area, there's going to be that backlash for better yeah. or for worse. And I think in certain circles, it's not as accepted to be an outspoken Christian or an, an outspoken agnostic or an outspoken atheist. Mm-hmm. Like if you came to some f- extreme far. I'm going to use quotation marks here because I want to consider them left because they're bigoted pieces of shit. If you as a Christian male who's well-versed in his knowledge and well-versed in his beliefs, when to some circles you would, no one would give a shit Yeah. about your views. Just like if I went to some conservative circles, they would just tell me stop pussyfooting and put my foot on the gas and start believing in Jesus. And they would just hang him. Yeah, I, I'd, I'd be dead either way. <laughs> And I, I think that's where a lot of it is lost is due to we got to take a look at the time that all these are written in again. And I want to go ahead and put my viewpoint out here. No matter the re, the reason I read the Bible, the Torah, the Quran, all with a grain of salt and try to learn something from them is due to the words of man. The fallibility. But don't let that Be a decide your religion for yeah. you. Yeah. And if you believe, you believe. Yeah. And there's yeah. nothing you can change about that. Right. Just like my viewpoints and my beliefs. We can talk here and I can learn. And maybe I come to my own beliefs one day on something stronger. Mm-hmm. But I'm not going to change him from atheist. I'm not going to change you from a Christian. Mm-hmm. You're not going to change me as an agnostic. But having a conversation opens up the the dialect and allows thoughts to be processed, and we just have to accept that. Right. And we have to look past all the of label. the questioning and the semantics. Yeah. Yeah, and also, like for example, what I mean, even like reg- non-religious, regular written history, man has warped it to fit a certain perception. And I, coming from my standpoint. Some moral, like, the morals and everything with the Bible, good stuff, good stuff. Mm -hmm. But with any written piece of work done by man itself, it leads to, there's that possibility. It's like, heck, there's books that don't even touch upon major modern events or even, like, World War II heavily. Stuff that has impacted just our modern timeline. Yeah, yeah. So I think, <clears throat> or uh, if books in the South just skipping past sli- the whole slavery issue, if you're going to question the words of man brought to you from an apostle or someone speaking about Jesus or Jesus's words himself, and you're not going to do the research, then why are you going to believe anything you've learned? Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. And it is, it's fundamental. Yeah. So, it, uh, and, and this is one thing like you kind of alluded to, and I'm, I'm just going to throw it out there is like this 
series of episodes evaluating Christianity, it is more of an objective approach. Yeah. It is not touching so much on the spiritual aspect of it because that's kind of a different yeah. thing. Be- beliefs are beliefs. Right. But like I, like we started with the arguments for God's existence and all, we, we have like at least there are some basis for reasons on a philosophical sense to yeah. believe that God yeah. could exist. And then here's like the historical objective approach for Christianity. And then obviously like, I don't want to ignore the spiritual side because that's a big part of it, but here's the history. Here, here is the objective historical basis for it. So it's not just because I think the narrative is, generally too emotional or spiritualized that it, it is so much based on feelings that facts and history yeah. don't come in at all. Yeah. And I I don't want to counter that by doing the complete opposite of that and saying, here's the facts and none of the spiritual stuff. Both parts, even though that's exactly what I'm doing with this play series. A heavy aspect and deciding that Christianity is for you. Here's what you believe. Here's your reasons. Yeah. yeah. And and I feel a lot of the misguidance in Christianity has been really pushed in the past, say, 50 years with the growing of media. And that's on both sides of pro and anti. Well, it's, yeah. it's, it's pushed, happened for hundreds of years. Yeah, but really. it's been pushed to the foresight more as we've grown more diverse as a culture. And also, a lot of people aren't informed on history in general yeah as i said with history books there's a lot like there's a lot of stuff people don't touch on that there's a lot of good things that have happened from christianity there's a lot of bad things that have happened from christianity there's a lot of good things that happen from atheists a lot of shitty things happen from oh a lot yeah so it's all about understanding and that and doing your research and what i'm trying to get at is like the core obviously like i said being objective not looking at too many modern day christians as examples because you can find good examples you can find bad examples yeah. i'm looking at the source at and for me history. when it comes when it comes to determining whether or not a religion is true or not you have to determine first of all is it a reliable source and second of all is it accurate yeah and, and like- that that should be the foundation before going forward um, and I think the case for Christianity is a lot stronger than for other religions, yeah, because it, which we will talk about later. It's based dun, in dun, dun. historical times. It's something that has happened with hi- in history. Yeah. It's not like, oh, yeah, there's God, and after that, uh, n- nothing on this no, it's physical like, plane has happened. Here's all of this history shit that may bore you, but is very important. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, anyway, we're going to go back to talking about the so- New Testament. Sorry about the tangent, nice guys. anecdote, which is fine. It was, it's necessary sometimes. Yeah. Uh, so the next section is the external evidence, which uh, I mentioned some of this in the episode, Jesus, who was he? But there's a lot of external evidence that attests to the ministry of Jesus and in works by Josephus, Tacitus, the Talmud, etc., And while they do not always conform to the Christian bias, they do verify certain claims made in the New Testament, such as Jesus existing, being crucified, who was ruling and where, etc. Other sources around the time believed in the miracles that Jesus performed, but assumed that he was using some type of sorcery. At the very least, this confirms that Jesus did actually perform the miracles spoken of in the New Testament. Josephus, in particular was a Jewish historian, not a Jewish Christian, uh, but he verified that Jesus was a moral teacher with a following, and he was put to death by Pilate by crucifixion, and that his followers claimed that he had risen from the dead, among other things. Also, most archaeological findings, give or take 15%, uh, around this time support the claims made in the New Testament. Earthquake records in the city where Jesus was believed to be crucified verify an earthquake occurring during the year Jesus was crucified, which is actually something the Gospels account of. They mention uh, an earthquake after he was being after he was crucified. Uh, and historical claims made in the New Testament cohere well with what we know about ancient history from other sources 
and the culture was presented accurately. Therefore, the New Testament was not written by later forgers. That's the end of that section. What are your thoughts, home dog? I gotta drink some water. Yeah, I think I poured my heart out already. Yeah, I mean, like in the also fuck you, Pomp- Pompous Pilot. Yeah, Pontius Pilot. Pontius Pont. That's Pompous. the worst. Pontius. He's pompous too. <laughs> it's fucking asshole. Yeah, I mean, Jesus ain't hey, did I nothing was... wrong. You just yeah, the... did you see that uh, clip I sent you? I haven't really looked at any social media this week. Yeah, I could tell. Yeah, it's been a fucked up week. Okay, well, but yeah, I mean, we'll you, check it out. Later. You did the nice Cliff Notes version of everything we went through. Yeah, yeah, that that's I I kind of made like a whole episode based on the external evidence, and then that yeah out because, to be a short episode, but like, whatever. Which as, if this is you guys is picking up point, go back and watch it. Yeah, go listen to the yeah. other episodes. They're important. They and build if, off of one another. And if y'all want a lot of a little bit more of the spiritual stuff, go check out our earlier episodes on the yeah. previous season. Yeah, it's very yeah. existential and, and philosophical. I mean, like, as as I said, like, man, it's fallible. But also, if there's a there, there's a lot of evidence that all say about the same stuff. Yeah. See, so, you know, it's yeah. weird. And this may be, like, an external thing. And I'm apologizing for any of you guys who have to listen to this. It's weird. You're the one who has, like, a kind of concrete religion mm-hmm. and I'm the one just kind of out there and David's the one who is like a concrete non-religion mm-hmm. well, that's that's the I mean, that's, that's, that's the premise podcast. of the show yeah I wish I I wish I had my own religion where I could bring some evidence that's fine <laughs> which can't really bring evidence of you know agnostic agnosticism, agnosticism. yeah agnosticism well, you, like you mentioned in your interview that's not necessarily an end that's yeah. kind of a traveling point yeah but you. you can't really pr- pull up like the and here's some history of this yeah. this. it's well, just one mean, big can, it's one big question mark you can point to like evidence and reasons you believe in god and yeah. i mean that's kind of what we did with the earlier episodes yeah yeah but it's kind of and, hard to get concrete and heck, even right with, with yeah. me, like yeah jesus existed there, there's too many people saying he existed for him not to exist yeah i'm glad that you're not have, one of those mythicists on there would have Reddit to be one giant conspiracy Twitter. yeah and, and he wasn't a dickhead thank god yeah yeah he, he followed david's first rule don't be a dick yeah. so david has to believe in him <laughs> all it takes don't be a dick well, no, well he did flip the tables at, at the uh He the, was fighting um, against big government. <laughs> yeah, but I he, guess kind he, of he was but fighting not against really. the tax man. He kind wasn't of. a dick though. Hey, everyone hate oh, conservative, liberal, everyone hates taxes. No, he was flipping tables at like the uh temple because The merchants. The merchants, yeah. I mean, yeah, I'll get down with that. Because they were they were turning into a, a marketplace and he's like I mean you're after, turning my father's house into a marketplace and he starts flipping over their money tables is somebody stuff. just talking that? about televangelists mm-hmm. oh, sorry probably, for the big boom probably yeah. Yeah. sorry uh, for the explosion. Let, let's let's take a moment let me go take a look at that all right well nothing just happened we're going to talk about the internal evidence uh for the reliability of the new testament Internal evidence, such as excessive non-theological verbiage, for example, Paul traveling to certain places, acknowledging certain rulers and regions and laws, etc. These details matter to specific people at a certain time period. If the New Testament were made up, these details would be unnecessary and likely incorrect. Writing things in ancient times was also very expensive and very time-consuming. One papyrus cost two denarii, roughly two days' worth of earnings. Enough papyrus for the book of Luke would cost five denarii, plus ink, time to write, and likely a scribe to write as well. This was obviously very expensive for later scribes to continue copying all of the details, so if certain non-theological details, such as those uh, rulers and regions and laws and stuff like that, why would they include it? It would have been a lot cheaper for later scribes to just keep the theological teachings and leave everything else out. But that's not what they chose to do, and it shows that they maintained the integrity of the original text. Now, here we got to talk about something that's really important when it comes to the New Testament and Christianity in general, and it's called the criteria of embarrassment. If something is embarrassing, 
It gives more probability to the truth of what an author is saying. This is all over the New Testament, from Jesus being born in a manger, to Jesus, the Messiah, being killed, to Jesus speaking with prostitutes, to women being the first to discover the empty tomb. If you wanted people to believe your story, why have your Messiah be born in a manger and die on a cross? These are embarrassing details and demonstrate how low he is. But that's precisely the point. The early church also faced various issues, such as whether or not Gentiles should be circumcised, or what the place of women in the church is. And the answers to these questions were provided in letters from Paul. It would have been much easier for later scribes to have put words in Jesus' mouth than to claim that a council had to be called and dispute these issues and continue wasting money by documenting and preserving these events. We will discuss the details of the uh, we will discuss the details more that meet the criteria of embarrassment when we discuss the evidence for the resurrection. Uh, and then the last thing I have is undesigned coincidences, which are seeming contradictions. For example, the testimonies of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John aren't all the exact same story. Some leave out details that others include, while others flat out contradict what another says. But this is exactly what we would expect if four people witnessed something that happened. Their memories of the event would be different. Think of interviewing four member, four witnesses for a crime. If their stories were all exactly the same, it would be more likely that they got together and corroborated the details. But in general, each of the Gospels explain, give context, and fill out the details that are left out in, other, in the other Gospels to paint a more complete picture. Yeah. Now, now you can voice your thoughts. Yeah, I mean, the main thing with, like, why pay extra for, like, all the minute details, it's all about context. And also, I mean, people make terrible, like, a lot of Christian movies are just awful rom-coms. But they do it because they feel like it's the right thing to do, regardless of it's if it's going to flop or not. And a lot of it is just, like, the kind of idea of persevering through your morals. And also, like, with writing it down with like a scribe it provides that context for the time and as we said context is everything yeah and plus, a lot of um there were a lot of forgeries around this time that were clearly noted as forgeries and they're not in the bible so i mean like there there are like there's like the gospel of judas which is an obvious uh gnostic gospel that is not accurate that and sounds like, like a cash grab there no there's a, there's a bunch of uh gospels and non-canonical books that are forgeries or mockeries that were coming up around that time yeah. that just didn't have that historical reliability and you can tell that they're written by later authors because they don't preserve the culture accurately or they they miss details I mean, or stuff like that like well like would a, you be yeah. able to if, if i were to ask you what is the currency that Mexico used a hundred years ago? Hmm. Now write a story about them, and you have to convey that correctly. You you would be able to tell that you made it up because you may not yeah. get that detail right unless I had time to do my research. Yeah, and, I and mean, but these people didn't have internet. Yeah, and it was also like the job of a scribe, not just for like writing stuff down, but also they were preservers of history. Yeah, because yeah. I mean. One of the key jobs as an early scribe was pre preserving just about anything you can get your hands on. Yeah, and yeah. to bring this to a more metaphorical point, if you're an artist, that extra Sorry hour you're going to spend on that one little detail that could mean the world or could mean nothing, that can last for millennia. Mm -hmm. What is a day is worth of work? For word that will be carried as truth through millennia. Yeah. Yeah. You got to think of that, that these people, that was their calling. Yeah. Is to recite these and to bring forth the word 
So to them, it's a big deal. That money is nothing, right? Compared to their faith, just like look at some missionaries. What's a couple of years of your life to go help others when that help could help build yeah. something for or, decades and hundreds of yeah. years? Or even say a different religious culture and Buddhist culture. I mean, one of the things you do for like, for example, like good luck for your family, good things to happen is to become a monk. And like, even for a few years to them, it's worth it to experience that not just for themselves, but for their culture. Yeah. Or, yeah. And it's just that kind of that passion. It's looking to something greater than yourself. Yeah. For meaning, Even if essentially. it's... And to tie it yeah. to a more modern earthly term, if you're, say, a parent, mm-hmm. your decades of hard work and suffering to bring forth a good life for your child is worth more than that little bit of extra time or that little bit of extra money. Worth more life matter. itself, some would say. Yeah. And so when people would ask those questions on why they would do this or why they would do that, you got to think this is something greater than themselves. This is first religion, but literally the continuance and essentially the birth of a modern religion. And on top of that, it's also art. Yeah. I mean, because how some prophets would poetically put things and whether or not you're a Christian or not, you got to accept that it's also art on top of religion. Yeah. And, yeah. Also, and that doesn't take away from the truth that it withholds. Yeah. Right. And I'm also glad you brought up the other main thing, which is like four different people wrote it. They're going to have different memories and different viewpoints and perspectives, even yeah. if it's the same thing. Yeah. If, if you think of four people who witnessed would, someone robbing a bank, yeah. you're sitting in four different places and you don't know this person that robbed the bank. Uh, it happened very fast. You aren't. You don't know the person that did it. You're you and those four other three other people that are in different places of the bank that witnessed this. You're going to have yeah, different. And also, what as we as perspe- perceptions you said, like it was written over forty years. Yeah. So time does play a little bit of part in that. And it would be more unbelievable if it was all exactly the same because the only one way it could be exactly the same is if they all copied each other. Yeah, and I or mean, or if one person wrote it. that yeah. also ties into interpretation. If you put a hundred Christians in a room and you say the same verse and they give you the all hundred give you the same answers, I don't think they got it. Because you, would, you would probably be like everyone's guys. perception is different. Everyone's experience is different. We're all looking through our own lens. Yeah. And history is. It would have to be a vague verse, though, not like something like "Here's the genealogy of so and so," and they'd just be like, "Yeah, but, I just mean they you came know from so and so." Like, have to be, what you, does this mean to you? Yeah, you would have to one ask, of those like, type of verses. Yeah, I know what you mean. Or how do how would you tie this into your life? Yeah. If or like um, everyone, how would gave, you relate this? Ev- if everyone gave the same relation, y'all were talking about this way before. Or one thing, like ask your ass as like, okay, how does God? What does God's love mean to you? Because like for everyone, that's different. Like the core is the same, mm-hmm. but how people both say it, even if they mean slightly different, and also just their perception of it i mean in effects, t- tied to a more modern term if you go and ask a hundred different people back from 1864 what the what the eventual freeing of slaves would mean to them i guarantee you they're all going to have a hundred different answers oh yeah because you're going to talk to some slaves some slave owners I actually did a, uh, some writing well a discussion in my sociology class on kind of those events and boy, there was a lot. Yeah, and so I don't think that the different viewpoints and perspectives take away from the validity of something. Yeah. If not, it only adds more because it, at least from reading it, I mean, the no 100% validity, you would have had to been there, but it's all slightly different, but the core is still the same. And we're all human. Yeah. Yeah. So, two things I wanted to mention. Number one, uh, like I mentioned in the last episode, um, 
it wasn't necessarily from the get go the intention to write the Bible, yeah. to write the New Testament. Um, for example, if Paul were told that thousands of years later people would be reading his letters to other churches, he would probably be a little bit surprised because he wasn't. He was intending to address an issue at that current yeah. time. He would have worded it way differently, probably. He probably, yeah. He, if he were addressing, I don't know, all of people throughout all Christian times, Everybody. he would probably he probably would have written it a little bit differently. Um, but he didn't. But he was that again. He was addressing a certain instance, um, and with the Gospels, obviously they wanted to preserve the teachings of Jesus. And then it wasn't until later when, uh, you know, people started collecting these writings and saying like, we need to remember this. We need to read this. And then that began the process of canonization. Yeah. And I think that ties into what's a day's worth of work to teach others and to spread your word yeah. in the gospel that you believe in. Yeah. Because, like, they they probably thought, like, oh, this is just going to go one one group. Yeah. If turns out it's affected a lot of history. And for, oh, yeah. for all they knew, they could be persecuted and drop dead tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then the second thing I wanted to mention was, um, obviously, the, this, this was more directed towards, like, skeptical people that don't trust anything about Christianity. So, like how the Bible was written and the reliability of the New Testament. Like some people like me at a certain point, I never even really questioned the reliability of the New Testament, but it's important information to know if you're going to speak to people who are skeptical about it. And like, I take it that you guys aren't as skeptical as some people, but mm. you do have some degree of skepticism. Yeah. So it's important to be able to communicate that with people that yeah. don't know. But yeah, and as see, like I said, like with history, like reading a history book, it's good to be skeptical because at least then you can start doing your research and figure out like, okay, a bunch of these people say this, this one rendition only says this, there's something missing. Yeah. Yeah. And as I mentioned in our first series, we have free will and I can't, I don't believe God would have gave us free will if he didn't want us to question things to learn from them. We have a mind for a reason. And so Unconscious. if you go your whole life without questioning your religion, I, I don't view you as I've, I will view you as whatever you want to be viewed as, but deep down I'm like, I don't think he gets it. Yeah. Because to question is to wonder and to seek for answers. Right. Just like you have. And just like a lot of preachers have a lot of, as kids, people. as kids, we question things and we learn from them. Yeah. I feel like growing up, I sometimes got a lot of pad answers and that's why I found stuff like this really informative. Yeah. yeah and that, that's one thing. If, you, if you have kids out there and they ask a really big question, you don't have to dumb it down for them that much. Like, just speak to them. Yeah. If yeah. they don't understand it then, let them know, like, hey let me do a little more research let me figure out like more specifics because kids are very good at specifics tell them a broad answer ain't gonna do nothing for them yeah and, and let them know like hey when you're it older it also probably depends on the age of the child yeah and, what their comprehension level is yeah, and stuff yeah, like that and if, but, yeah. if they're they don't quite get it write it down and bring it up like maybe next year or the year after yeah, yeah and keep and, that conversation because the best thing you can do is learn and another thing is don't be afraid of not having an answer. No one has every answer. Yeah. You always will have questions. And as long as you do your best to try to figure it out, it's all, all, all anyone would ask. God doesn't ask for a perfect person. He asks for someone who believes in the Savior and, in my viewpoint, someone who lives through his word. Yeah. So you don't have to know everything as long as you make a conceited effort to push forward. Uh, one other thing, um, and, and I kind of alluded to this earlier, is in terms of reliability and textual reliability, it, I mentioned it was 94% accurate. Um, so there are certain Christians that are going to tell you the Bible is the inerrant word of God, and no document is inerrant. 
unless it was written yesterday and you watched someone write it. I mean, like this is a you know a couple thousand year old document. It's bound to have some errors, yeah. so you have to be honest with that. That to me mm-hmm. doesn't pose much of an issue because much of the discrepancies are fairly easy to remedy mm-hmm. and, and and for how long it's been 6% around it's pretty good for how and long it's been around that's pretty pretty minor accurate minor text yeah. issues pretty good yeah and as, as i said with my viewpoint on all this nothing's 100 percent perfect right and if one little error is going to shake your faith did you have faith before because in the end of it this is just for the most part morals and lessons to live your life by and things to view the world through is a lot of the bible and Mm -hmm. things to teach you so and a lot of the errors come through context yeah unless unless you want to sit there yourself and go through every little sequence unless you want to be a scholar and be a scholar if you you want to props that's yeah go for it i mean there's a lot of and as i said there's nothing wrong with not having the answers yeah and I don't, I'm not a Christian not because of the small errors you may find in the Bible. Because no religious text is going to be perfect. Because yeah. if it's perfect, you better have been watching God himself come down from heaven into a human form and be able to inquivocally say, that is God, and watch him write those. That's the only way there's going to be no errors ever. Yeah. Yeah. Um and I think that's just damn near impossible. <laughs> yeah, that's that's kind of like the way I see it is like that's the point of apologetics. It's the defense of the faith. For obviously I need answers for myself, but also even if the answer doesn't necessarily pertain to me or really bother me or, or the question I still need to have that answer if I'm communicating with someone else that has that question. Yeah. So I mean like if you ask, like, yo, what was the deal with the Old Testament? Like, I need to have answers for that. Which, spoilers, we're going to have an episode on that in boom, the boom, future. Boom. Wow. But even even as a non-Christian, this helps me communicate with, say, when I have deep conversations with co-workers or friends who are Christians, this allows me to come from a... More informed perspective. More informed, less yeah. biased viewpoint and connect with them on a deeper level and understand where they are coming from and try to get them to understand their faith more as I've understand my spirituality more. Right. Cool. Well, as we wrap up this episode, I want to ask you guys, uh, after surveying the evidence, do you think that the new Testament is reliable? It's as reliable as an old piece, an old document can be. And I want to leave it at that because I do have a lot of research to do. Mm -hmm. But when you take in a fact that how many different ways is just let's stick to America. American history is written. How many different ways are there so many things that they don't put out or they shift to their own viewpoint or narrative? Yeah. Of course, that's going to happen, but not necessarily in the book. It's more going to happen through with the Bible interpretations or vocalizations. And I think it's every Christian and person who's going to speak upon Christianity job to sit there and research that and understand it. Yeah. And accept that not everything is going to be a blood in blood out definition. Yeah. Yeah. Especially today with how, vast the wealth of knowledge we have you just don't have to listen to say your pastor and only take his perspective because a lot of people i know are yeah, just because, like they only take the one person yeah because some hear. pastors are scholarly and as you said some aren't some are complete lay people yeah, yeah so unless you can have that conversation with your pastor and get to know them get to know what they have studied how they their interpretations, how that might differ and whatnot. Don't take their word 100%. And even after that, take it maybe 75%. Do the legwork yourself because we have the information. Yeah. Yeah. And think, think of it like a criminal case. 
There's one side of the story, there's another side of the story, and then there's the truth. You may never know the 100% accurate truth, but it's your job as a juror or as the person questioning Christianity or as the person trying to teach Christianity to do your best yeah, to find that truth. And, I mean, you also got to take context. Again, like last episode, context is so much in the Bible and in historical documents and all that. Because we may see one thing now is absolutely fucked up, but it was just a normal day for them. Yep. That's a lot of the Old Testament. Yeah. But and uh, that's a lot of people's... We'll get to that when we get to that. Yeah. Issues I mean, with no, the we Bible. All, we also touched on like one of the earliest episodes with... It's based upon the context of that culture. Like, yes, it might be morally messed up, but for the culture, it was totally normal. Yeah. yeah. And so just do your research, people. Have these open conversations. Don't be afraid to question things. Uh, don't take everything word for word, but also don't be afraid to believe that something is true. Yeah, you, you can think... You can half a good idea that something is pretty plausibly true and still not like with religious texts and still not believe in it and that's fine don't be afraid of being wrong because say if i was afraid of being wrong i wouldn't be where i'm at bailey if you're afraid of being wrong when you were growing up as a young christian would you be where you're at now in your spirituality no don't be afraid you of- gotta have you gotta have you gotta ask questions to get answers, and you gotta. Sub, you may be wrong sometimes, and it's okay. Oh, you'll yeah. definitely be wrong sometimes. Yeah, let's yeah. kind of that's the fun the part. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think that's another just big, big point of this whole podcast is learn, accept your wrongs, and do your best to figure it out. Yeah, if anything, it'll make you a stronger person in your beliefs. Yeah. So or lack thereof. <laughs> Uh, just to bring it to a close, because I asked you if you think the New Testament is reliable. Do you, do you think the New Testament is reliable, David? I, I'm in the field with Michael where it's as plausibly like historically reliable. reliable as any human text can be. Yeah. And, I mean, as you said, 96%. 94. Well, 94% Close enough. error-free. That's pretty damn good. And how many yeah. languages has it possibly had the past through? Uh, well, it, it was originally in Greek and Hebrew and Aramaic. Um, what about dialects? That's throwing a whole nother monkey wrench oh, in there. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, there are different manuscripts that have like, um, like I mentioned, like the synonyms that are different, which probably has to do a bit with dialects and stuff like that. Yeah. And um, so but make translating it-, it into other languages, generally they're going to start from the original language and then translate it into say like English or whatever yeah, but it's been translated into almost all the languages and to make it to such a bastardized language even from English. English with that little that small that's a relatively small margin of error because you can put a yeah. sentence in your phone from one language to English and it's going to get fucked up well well, one thing to notice is uh, the what what I what that number comes from is when you're comparing all the manuscripts yeah. in Greek and Hebrew, ninety four percent of them are the same. So that's not accounting when it's translated into English because, I mean, like I'm not saying that. I mean, it could create error. Yeah, but even then, but all those manuscripts together, the and- original manuscripts are accurate. But obviously, like I said, the the different translations and stuff that's that's a different. Yeah. That's a different realm. But even then, just with the manuscripts, yeah. that's kind of... And can't forget, it's been impressive. translated from Old English to New English at least a few times. Yeah. Um, but as I, as I was mentioning to, to wrap up, um, most scholars and historians today view the New Testament as reliable. Although not all are Christians, that doesn't mean we shouldn't trust that it is that we shouldn't trust that it is at the very least reliable information. At least from a historical context. Yeah. Because yeah. I mean, heck, when you can like there tell there was an earthquake at a certain time, it's like, yeah, right after he was crucified, there's an earthquake. That's pretty dang reliable. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's just one example of yeah. the archaeological evidence. There's a lot more and I haven't delved into a, a lot of it. Um, I think the series that I'm referencing actually 
said there are so many archaeological findings that it's too much to list in one video. So I'm just going to list the, all the sources in the description. So on top of the sources that are in this video, uh, this podcast episode's sources has their own sources. So it, it kind of gets into its own rabbit trail. Then you can go to the library and find even more sources. Yeah. So anyway, um, that's pretty much it for this episode. Uh, definitely share it with your friends and follow us on social medias and all that stuff. All our contact is, all our contact information is in the show notes and the sources as well. Um, and next time we're gonna talk about the most important topic in all of Christianity: the resurrection and whether or not it happened. See you all then. As Jesus would say, love you guys. Love you. Even if you put a spear through me. Jesus loves you. Yes, Jesus I know. Jesus is the one. You ended another episode like that. We can't we can't do that. Yeah, we can. No. Jesus. No.